okay? But <laughs> more so than that, I'm actually interested in the uh, kinds of computation that actually go on in nervous systems. So I'm gonna give a talk. Uh, I want it to be informal, ask questions if you wish. There aren't gonna be any equations, there'll be a few diagrams. But what I really want to do is, is get across sort of the mystery and the computational complexity of just one subset of the nervous system of some fairly small and simple animals. So and those animals are the insects. And insects, particularly flying insects, rely heavily on vision. And their vision is, has very low spatial resolution compared to vertebrates, but it's very sensitive and very fast. And of course, everybody's seen a compound eye on a, on a bug knows they have a really wide field view. They can see most of the visual sphere. And visual motion is especially important to, uh, particularly to flying insects. They use it for stabilizing flight. They use it for avoiding collisions and for detecting other insects. So this is just a couple videos to start things off. The first video is of, a, of some butterflies. There's a female on this flower and there's a couple males that are hovering over her and doing a little dance. And this is all controlled through their vision. And so you'll see in a moment or two, another male is gonna come and land on the flower that's on the right. And after that happens, uh, you're gonna see the female decides she's had enough and she takes off and immediately all three males catch that in their eyes and just bottle her. And the second video is uh, an interaction between two dragonflies, which are some of the most acrobatic flyers in nature. You could barely see what happens, but these two uh, insects encounter each other they do a little dance and then they both go flying off. And again, this is behavior that's uh, controlled through vision. It gives you an idea of how fast their eyes are in that process. <clears throat> so in asking how insects detect visual motion in their, uh, in their nervous system, the question is really, how can we determine this? And years ago, some scientists took a behavioral approach. They found an insect that had a particular behavioral reaction that's governed by vision. I don't want to go into the details of it, but they found a way to basically tether it or to put it in a uh, situation where they could measure its reaction while giving it visual stimuli. And they uh, looked at what the dependence of various parameters of the motion or the reaction were on parameters of the motion. And probably the most important one is the dependence of the response on the speed. What they saw were these sort of uh, bell-shaped non-monotonic curves. So you get a monotonic response for a while as you increase the speed of the stimulus, and then the response kind of drops off. Uh, and they figured that this had to be a reflection of the neural computation that's going on in this pathway. So how can we model this? Well, one, one thing we can do is use our intuition and think about what happens if an edge or a feature passes across the field of vision and goes from one receptor to the next. You would expect that there would be some correlation between the luminance changes at the downstream neuron and, or I'm sorry, the downstream receptor and the luminous changes a few moments earlier at the upstream receptor. And so these two scientists I mentioned built a model based on this. It's become a very famous model, even though it's rather abstract. But if you think about it, if you have, uh, if these represent signals coming from two receptors, if you have an edge or a feature going from left to right, you first get a reaction on, in this channel, and then that gets delayed. And then that gets compared or multiplied by the reaction at the subsequent channel. And this sort of uh, symmetric structure here get, enables this detector to code for motion in both directions. And that's not to say that we there's actually a detector with this structure in the nervous system. But this is explanatory. Uh, it allows symmetrical coding of motion in either direction. <clears throat> 
and it reproduces that speed tuning that I mentioned in the previous slide. Now you think if you wanted to use this as a speedometer, it would be a pretty lousy one because you get up to a certain speed, then all of a sudden your um, the response starts going down. But the fact is that there's a substantial uh, there's a substantial range of speeds over which it gives a monotonic reaction, and this is a uh, this is a you know this is a log scale. This is a range of speeds that's definitely of behavioral importance to uh, the the animal that they were studying. Now, there's a number of issues with this model. One is that its response to narrowband imagery, like sinusoidal gratings, depends on temporal frequency and not speed. And this is just another way of saying if you have a sinusoidal grating and you're moving it by the eyes of this animal, if it has a long wavelength and it's going at a faster speed, you're going to end up with kind of a similar reaction to something that has a short wavelength and moves at a slower speed. Um, this isn't really a problem for modeling, though, because this same feature is seen behaviorally in their model animal. Um, and it's sort of mitigated by the fact that natural images tend to have consistent broadband statistics so that you can get sort of a consistent uh, reaction out of the model. Another issue is that this is supposed to be modeling something's happening in the nervous system. There isn't really a clear way to implement a product type of interaction or something similar to a product with neural machinery. Um, this really has to be and like. You don't want it to respond to just inputs in one of the two legs. You want, want it to respond to a correlation between both of them. Uh, the response is noisy. Every time a feature or an edge goes by, this detector, there's a big transient, and it really represents, say, the speed only in the mean response. And perhaps very significant is the fact that the response depends on the contrast image in a quadratic fashion. Because if you remember the last slide, this model has a multiplier, and, and, and it multiplies two signals that are related to contrast. So this shows the results of a, the simulated responses of an array of this model to an animated natural images that have different global contrasts. You can see these curves are similar in shape, they have similar peaks, but their amplitudes are, are very different depending on contrast. So this is a, a really a, sort of an ugly feature if you want to try to get information about speed out of, out of this detector. So, um, you know, scientists from this time forward started asking, can we find motion sensitive cells in uh, the nervous systems of animals? And the answer to that is yes. And these have been studied now for over 40 years. Um, most of the cells that have been studied uh, reside fairly deep in the visual pathway. Although scientists have also found smaller neurons earlier that uh, either show some sort of motion sensitivity or appear to, <clears throat> to provide inputs to neurons that do. And these have been studied by a variety of techniques, which, which I don't really want to go over, but this top technique, the intracellular electrode, is sort of a, uh, a gold standard for, for studying neural responses because it allows you to get inside one individual neuron and look at its, at its membrane potentials uh, in response to whatever you're stimulating it with. Um, there's a very famous example, one that was they started studying in the early 80s called the lobular plate tangential cell. And these are big neurons that are located in the third optic ganglia of insects. So I'm gonna talk about those a little bit more in a moment, but first I wanna give a better idea of what the visual pathway looks like leading up to these cells that are fairly deep in the brain. Um, in the earlier visual processing, of course, it starts with photoreceptors and uh, these actually could be regarded as processing elements in themselves. For one thing, they're dependent on contrast rather than absolute luminance. And that's very much like what we have in our own retina. Um, if you read, say, a, a, white, a book with a white page and black lettering on it, 
that's what it looks like, whether it's out in the bright sunlight or if it's in a dim room, even though in the bright sunlight, the black letters might be, it might be reflecting more light to your eyes than the white page does uh, in a dim room. And then immediately following the photoreceptors is an optic ganglion called the lamina. And this has what oops. happened yet? Uh, this does what look like operations of spatial and temporal filtering. And it also does uh, various forms of nonlinear processing. And one of interest to us is the separation of signals into on and off channels, or an on-channel response to uh, increases in luminance and off-channel to decrements in luminance. And both of these channels respond with excitation, uh, which is sort of interesting. The on-channel you could understand, but the off-channels, when something gets dimmer, they get excited. And then in the third optic, or I'm sorry, the second optic ganglion is where we believe motion processing, or at least the bulk of it happens. Uh, we find neurons that are sensitive to motion um, and there appear to be motion de detectors formed for both the on and off uh, channels. Um, these are distributed retinotopically, means, meaning that there's a map from the retina to each one. So they sort of tile the visual field to give an idea of motion at different locations. Um, they're aligned with the cardinal directions, which in the front of the visual field will be up and down and left and right. And this is particularly interesting because the eye of the insects, the facets are hexagons. And so there, there are actually three axes between uh, each set of detectors and their nearest neighbors. So somewhere there's been a transformation to the sort of the uh, required basis state for a 2D space uh, with, with, with two directions represented. And there are other kinds of processing that are going on that I'm not going to go into. There's a lot of stuff in this ganglion. It, it's, it's a very large structure in the visual system. And just to give you an idea, uh, maybe a clear mental idea of what this looks like, I, I put together a schematic diagram showing the pathway of course, the first thing that happens is photoreception. And then this feeds this first optic ganglion with these various operations here. And one thing I want to emphasize is there is a cartridge or group of cells in this structure for every facet in the eye. So there's parallel processing going on for every, every input signal. Um, now, there are certain, certain neurons that go in this direction that implement various kinds of spatial processing that have information about what's happening at other detectors. But this entire suite of processing is reproduced for every facet. And then in the second optic ganglion, we have these elementary motion detectors. So I've sort of tried to represent a group of four for each location or maybe each pair of receptors in the visual field, uh, again, on and off channels and vertical and horizontal directions. Uh, and it, I think it's important to emphasize that there might not necessarily be one individual neuron that corresponds to this one detector. It might be a distributed function among multiple detectors. So following this are sets of cells in the next optic ganglion that collect inputs from these EMDs. Um, these integrate motion information over wide areas of the visual field. And they actually Im implement a form of computation in themselves. They detect patterns of optic flow. And, and that term optic flow just means a pattern of motion induced on the retina by usually by movement of the animal in an environment. So there are various sorts of patterns you can imagine. And here I've tried to depict a cell that's collecting inputs only from EMDs that are aligned with the horizontal direction. So you can imagine this might be a neuron that's sensitive to, uh, to horizontal motion, which would be induced by the animal yawing about a vertical axis. 
Now, if a neuron only got inputs from vertical, uh, from vertical EMDs, then you could have a neuron that's responsive to pitch, uh, to pitch rotations. And you can imagine more complicated or sophisticated uh, sorts of patterns. And just, just to give you some mental idea, here I've depicted a neuron that collects uh, information from leftward sensitive EMDs on the left side and rightward sensitive EMDs on the right side. If you think about it, if you're flying through some cluttered environment, the pattern motion you'll see will be progressive. On the left side, it will go from the left backwards and from the right side, we'll go from the right back backwards. So something that's uh, configured like this would be configured to detect progressive motion. So this weighted summation by which EMDs you hook up to and what the weights of the synaptic interconnections are determine a functionality that allows you to sort of match different patterns of optic flow. This is a well-known computational model for what these kinds of cells do. And then I say weighted summation, if you're going to be biologically uh, faithful, there are actually non-linearities involved uh, in synaptic transmission that have to be included. So uh, back to these neurons I mentioned, uh, an example is a neuron, an identified neuron called the H1 neuron that's been studied in flies. And this is an identified, the fact, when I use this term identified, what I mean is that it's stereotypical, it has a stereotypical size, stereotypical response, and it's present from animal to animal. So it can be studied in a large sample of animals. And this is, in fact, a neuron that is sensitive to yaw or horizontal motion. So at this point, um, you know, we talked about behavior, but at this point, I think, uh, the logical question to ask is how does its response compare to the, that raw EMD model that I introduced earlier on? In, in particular, do you have these sort of uh, bell-shaped speed tuning curves? Do you have a strong contrast dependence? And what we see in these neurons is yes, we have a bell-shaped dependence, but we have a remarkable invariance with respect to contrast. And the uh, fact is, nobody really knows how they do this. Um, I studied it myself when I was first getting involved in this field with some colleagues, and we tried out a whole bunch of sort of biologically plausible mechanisms for how you can get rid of this dependence, and we could never achieve the sort of invariance you see in these actual neurons. So that's an open question somebody needs to answer some. So at this point, it might be good to stop and see if anybody has any questions. I've sort of gone from this EMD model to this concept of optic flow detection. And I want to switch gears and talk about other forms of motion detection. Yeah. Where does the perception of so to get motion detection? Is it in the neurons or is it a different part of the bug brain? Or well. I don't know what you mean by motion detection. I mean, there, there are neurons fairly early on that respond selectively to motion. So if you flickered a light or did something like that, the photoreceptors would respond, but these neurons don't respond to, to stimuli like that. So if you want to call that perception, you could say it, it happens you know, in an intermediate stage. Um, and then the, the last set of cells I talked about are really for perception of how am I moving in my environment based upon the motion I see on my retina? So does the output of the last set of cells like drive the movement? There are connections to the central brain. So in insects, I mean, they're simple, but there tend to be a lot of different types of stimuli that can drive their behavior. And the central brain integrates sensors like olfactory sensors I mean, the eyes are the most important, but there's olfactory sensing, there's things like sensing the wind over their uh, carapace, things like that. So, and there are, so there are decisions made on like, do I need to avoid this object in front of me or do I want to land on it? And 
those sorts of things are sorted out in this, more in the central brain. So what I've talked about happens in three progressive ganglia in the optic system, which dominate the size of the brain because of the importance of vision. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so you might imagine insects uh, need other to detect other forms of motion to react effectively in their environments. Uh, one sort of mode might be the detection of distinct moving objects of a fairly large size, like say a fly swatter looming in front of them, or maybe if they're flying around, they want to land on a tree trunk or something like that. So these are objects that move with respect to background and are sort of uh, can be segmented out as distinct objects. And then you might also want to detect small moving targets. And by small, I mean things that subtend only one to a few facets. And this is actually needed by any insect that pursues other insects on the wing. Um, now, I said that their eyes have poor spatial resolution. And they're actually so poor that once an insect gets half meter to a meter away, it becomes a point target. They don't resolve wings or anything else. All they can see is that it's a sub facet sized target and it causes a little blip in the contrast. So they really need the capability of detecting things that are very small and very dim. And this is a difficult computation problem. Um, I'm funded by the Air Force. As you imagine, it's something that the Air Force is interested in as well, uh, is detecting targets, particularly from bad or noisy data. <clears throat> um, Sub-pixel objects are gonna induce small noisy signals on the photoreceptors, and the targets that you're pursuing tend to be non-cooperative. And in order to achieve this, you want to have a mechanism that's selective or small targets. You don't want responses to wide field motion. You don't want every time the fly yaws or something for these for any neurons that do this function to be firing off. So as it turns out, there have found neurons um, that are, appear to support small target detection and tracking. And they're found, these are two of the animals that you saw in the uh, in the videos at the beginning, this is a dragonfly, which chases uh, mosquitoes and flies on the wing. This is one kind of hoverfly. It looks like a bee, but it's actually more closely related to the houseflies. And it chases potential mates, as you saw, and uh, also rivals on the wing. So we call these um, neurons that have small target sensitivity, small target motion detector neurons, or STMDs. So I'm going to use that abbreviation from now on. Uh, they're found, again, in this third optic ganglion, fairly deep, the lobula. And they're also found have processes in, in the central brain. Uh, and they're sensitive to and selective for small moving objects. They don't respond to these wide field motion cues that the neurons we spoke about before do. And there appear to be two types based on where they're located and what the size of the receptive fields are. Does the idea of a receptive field make sense to everybody? Does everybody have an idea what that means? Basically, it's just the region in visual space that a neuron responds to or sees. So there are small field cells and wide field cells, and the small field cells are distributed over the visual field in a retinotopic mapping. So if one of those gets activated, it gives you some indication of where in the visual field the target is. And, then, and, we, and we believe that the wide field cells probably integrate the, out, the outputs of the small field cells. So various STMDs have been recorded from the lobula and from the deeper brain. Um, most of the data exists for wide field uh, STMDs there's a pretty good body for the small, uh, small field cells as well. And they, these two classes exist in both the dragonfly and the hoverfly. So these pictures down here, just to give you like a little bit of feel for what we're dealing with. Uh, this is a, a, a picture taken through a microscope of the back of a dragonfly brain. And you get maybe two thirds of the brain here. 
this is the right side, I'm sorry, the left side, and this yellow thing is a cell that's been stained with a dye, and it's an STMD neuron that projects from the lobby of the upper lobula into the deeper brain. And this is a tracing, uh, kind of a, the same structure. And this shows a STMD that, that we call CSTMD1. This is another identified cell that can be, uh, excuse me, can be studied from, from animal to animal. And it's become sort of a workhorse in the lab of the biologists who I collaborate with. So this is something that gets inputs in the brain on one side, projects all the way across the brain uh, to the opposite side brain and to the entire contralateral lobula. So it has this enormous projection and we think it probably has to do with maintenance and transfer of attention between the two eyes. You can imagine that a target that's moving around might move from one, one eye to the other. So the, the insect you know, has all this machinery for one eye but it also has to know that a uh, target is going from one eye to the other. And there's a very thick section here that they, they can pretty reliably get an intracellular electrode into. This is just a picture of an of a, uh, intracellular recording station. It's a pretty complex piece of equipment. We see this is a uh, manipulator holding an electrode holder, an insect. It's mounted on a little stage you can't really see here where it's fastened. And then here on the left, um, it's not here right now, but there's a large high-speed LCD display for displaying stimuli like moving small moving objects to the insect while the neurons being recorded from. Now, interestingly, I've talked about these two model animals, but uh, there have been possible analogs to these small field STMDs found in the fruit fly. Um, the cells are called lobular column, they're cells 11. So they've been identified and I think they hold a lot of hope for studying the mechanisms uh, behind these sorts of cells simply because we have very sophisticated genetic tools in, in fruit flies and able us to do things like calcium imaging and study multiple cells at the same time. Um, and fruit flies don't engage in the sort of aerobatic flight that we saw with these other animals but they do kind of have to see other fruit flies flying around. So it's not surprising that they have some sort of small target detection capability. So just to make clear, these STMDs that have been recorded from, their, their uh, receptive fields or their fields of regard tend to be quite a bit bigger than the size of the optimum targets they're sensitive to. Uh, optimum targets are in the range from about one facet up to two or three facets, or two or three degrees, I'm sorry, in the visual field. The small field STMDs have receptive fields that are uh, on the order of seven to 12 degrees across. And then the wide field STMDs can look at a large fraction of a visual hemisphere. Um, but even though we record at this level from cells that are responsive to small targets, or wide areas, we can still look at the responses and, and try to infer something about an elementary operation that supports small target detection. Excuse me, I'm <clears throat> fighting off a cold and getting worse. So uh, my collaborators and I have done that and come up with a model that we call an elementary small target motion detector or ESTMD. And uh, again, it's another computational model, and this is what it looks like. Looks sort of familiar, it looks sort of like an EMD or half of an EMD. And in this case, however, it gets its inputs from a single receptor and it correlates delayed off and undelayed on channels that are coming from that receptor. So if you imagine if a, if a small target passes in front of that receptor, and the target is darker than the background, which is typically the case because dragonflies chase their prey from below. So you have a bright sky, you have a darker target. As it passes over a pixel, uh, you're gonna first activate the off channel. You'll have a decrement in luminance. And then a brief time later, you'll activate the on channel as the trailing edge of the object goes past the 
past the uh, photo detector. And so we have this familiar structure. We have a some sort of delay operator. And then we correlate those two to get an output. Now we publish this model and there's a bunch of other processing that I, I'm not going to talk about. I mean, one important one, however, is <clears throat> their lateral inhibition at an earlier stage uh, that that sort of uh, squashes uh, responses to objects that are wide that cover multiple pixels. You can imagine if, if you didn't have some sort of inhibition, you could have a bar traveling up or down on the receptive field and uh, it would excite a whole bunch of these. But we really only want to look for small targets. So we want them to be small in lateral dimension as well as small in the direction they're moving. Um, and sometime later, we did uh, a, a number of experiments, right? I, I wasn't involved besides helping in experimental design, but where we recorded from wide field STMDs to try to confirm this model uh, what gave at least a reasonable representation of what was going on. So we had a stim simulation suite designed to help suss this out. And here uh, you have some stimuli. Uh, these, one, these stimuli on top, uh, we referred to as single edge small objects. It, these sort of look like rods that moved into or out of the, the uh, visual field. So you can imagine if you have a receptor sitting here, it would see a dark edge, but no light edge following that. And similarly, this one would see a light edge, but no dark edge. And then we even came up with a stimulus that had two off edges in a row, where you had a brighter background, and that transitioned to a gray region, and then subsequently to a black region. So this would, you would expect to induce like two blips in a row in the off channel. And then these were compared to responses to a small target. And indeed, the uh, STMDs respond to the target robustly, respond very little bit very little to these other stimuli, just a little bit above the sort of spontaneous level of activity we see in the cell. <clears throat> and we did other experiments uh, to quantify other predictions. Uh, this model has a bell-shaped tuning curve, just like the EMD. Uh, and, and you can imagine if a target goes by faster than the delay time, um, that you'd start to see this fall off in the response at high speeds. And uh, we did see that. And uh, another feature is that if you have a, a longer target that's moving faster, you can get a very similar response to a shorter target that's moving slower. And that, again, that makes sense because this is based strictly on the timing of uh, the passage of the edges. All right? Does that make sense? So uh, for the remainder of the talk, I want to talk, uh, discuss some what we call higher level or higher order functions in our recorded STMDs. These larger cells don't just collect ESTMD outputs. They have some features that are, I think, pretty remarkable. One is a form of motion facilitation that occurs, and I'm gonna talk about that in the next few slides. But a second one is a form of selective attention. Now you can imagine a bug like a dragonfly flying around looking for prey if it goes through a swarm of mosquitoes, it's going to see multiple targets at the same time. So we've done experiments where we presented multiple targets uh, to an animal and saw how these neurons respond. And kind of amazingly, they respond to only one of the two targets at a time. Now, how we know this depends on the fact that these cells have sort of inhomogeneous receptive fields. If you were to drift one target across one part of the receptive field, you would see a certain history of the response with you know, certain small ups and downs and so on. If you drift the target through a different place, different area, you would see a different history. They're distinct enough that we can tell them apart. But if you do, do two targets at the same time, the response of the cell always looks like the response for one of the two targets or the other. Okay. And one, very, every once in a while, you will even see for half of the transit, you'll see it seem to follow one target and then switch and, and follow the sort of history for the second target as if it's shifting its attention. 
So this, I think, is a is a sort of astounding result. This is something that's studied in vertebrates' attention, and it's sort of regarded as a cognitive function. It's a very high level function. But here we found an individual neuron in insects that gives a sort of proto-cognitive ability. So we think that uh, the facilitation and this attention are sort of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of tied together. Uh, the facilitation is fascinating in itself. What, what we define it to be is an increase in the excitability of a wide field STMD with exposure, continued exposure to a target that moves on a continuous path. So this picture here shows a receptive field. This is for a CSTMD1 uh, in the, that sees the right eye. And the heat mapping shows how excitable it is. So the target, small target right up here is going to elicit a maximal response. And uh, as you move a target on a long continuous path uh, to a certain location, you will get a larger response at that location than if the target has moved along a shorter path. So that's sort of the first order definition of facilitation. And as I said, you get, you get an increase in response strength. Here we have a, a longer target path, and you have a higher spike rate out of this neuron than if it's a short target path. But more than that, what this really amounts to is an increase in the contrast sensitivity in this system. And by contrast, I mean sort of the relative illuminance of a target versus the background. And my collaborators did experiments where they looked at short unfacilitated responses with two short targets and then facilitated responses. And you see a little bit of increase in range when you have facilitation. But the most remarkable thing is this massive shift leftward uh, from the unfacilitated to the facilitated state. And uh, the way these experiments were done, if you haven't sort of figured it out, is they did a series of tests with targets of different contrasts, like really dim targets that didn't differ much from the background to like purely black targets against a pure, pure white ground on this end, white background. So you can see that uh, for sort of low and intermediate target contrasts, you can get a really massive boost in response. And qualitatively, this makes sense. Again, you have noise in the system, you have noise even at the level of photoreceptors. And having seen a target going by for a while, you have more confidence that a small blip in your system actually corresponds to the target as opposed to being noise. So you, you boost the gain up to kind of catch this. Um, another interesting feature is that this facilitation has a bell-shaped tuning curve, much like uh, the uh, ESTMDs themselves. So it's more most pronounced at the velocity of something like 70 or 80 degrees per second in the visual field. And this is also a velocity of, of a lot, that has a lot of behavioral interest for the animals. So my colleagues did a bunch of experiments or a set of experiments that were really technically demanding, but they were aimed at looking at the spatial properties of facilitation within a receptive field. So what they did was they drifted sort of a medium long target, medium long target path in the receptive field. And then they probed that with little short target excursions and they didn't restrict them just to the region right after the, the main, main target, which they call the primer. They, they put these probes at various places in the receptive field and uh, repeated this experiment to get sort of a map of how facilitation can vary in the receptive field. And the results were pretty fascinating. Uh, there is a spatially local focus of facilitation given by the red colors on this heat map. And it appears like right at and in front of a target that's been moving on a continuous path. In fact, most of the receptive field has a depressed responsivity. <clears throat> So this has a sort of a predictive feature, right? You're, 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 uh, look, you're jacking up your gain and looking for events that happen right in front of where a target has previously been. And uh, 
I mean, to me, this is fascinating, but it's even more fascinating what happens if you run your primer and then you wait a couple hundred milliseconds and then do your probes. And what they see is that this area of facilitation appears to propagate forward from where you last saw a moving object in retinotopic space. So again, uh, and this, this is an astounding result to me, uh, and it confirms that there's a predictive aspect of this phenomenon. Now, I've said that, or I haven't said it yet, but targets in the real world have to follow continuous paths, but once in a while they get occluded by flying behind something. So it makes sense that you would like this sort of capability to pick a target up after it's come out from behind something. So right now, my interest is in modeling this and uh, helping to design experiments to try to figure out what's going on with it. Um, and what comes to mind when you see the results I just presented is that maybe it's mediated by some sort of, sort of wave propagation in a two-dimensional medium that has some sort of retinotopic mapping in it. And it seems like you'd have to assume that this medium in the brain would have to be some retinotopically organized network of cells, and they'd have to be sort of local to where facilitation takes place. Um, and they'd have to be excited and activated, presumably by inputs from elementary target detectors, uh, much like the, the small field STMDs are themselves. And they would have this effect would have to be able to modulate the excitability of the STMD. So it's not like an input that causes excitation. It's an input that modulates excitation and makes them more excitable. And uh, it's observed in small field STMDs and in the wide field cells, which the results I just talked about are from wide field cells. And sort of, that sort of makes sense because the small field STMDs are retinotopically organized. So this might be a place where there's a substrate where you could have uh, some sort of wave propagation that had the ability to, to uh, modulate those cells. Uh, some of the characteristics that wave would have to have, um, it appears that the, the, this locus of facilitation moves in the order of 30 to 45 degrees per second in the visual field. Doesn't seem to be heavily dependent on the velocity of the stimulus, but this is a, a behaviorally useful speed. And if you're going to look at this, this is in the visual field. So if you map that down to the retinotopic region of the brain where this is occurring uh, and see how fast it would physically have to be moving in that, in that uh, neural pill or, or neural region, it's much slower than an electrical signal that propagates, typically propagates the nerve cells. Uh, but it's too fast and too for persistent to be mediated by something like diffusion of a chemical throughout a network of cells. So what might the physical substrate be? Well, it could be a, a, a network of, of neurons, which you know, have sort of these rapid, rapidly moving potentials, but with very slow interconnection synapses that retard the uh, propagation of the wave. Or it could be a cellular network that supports a, some sort of chemical wave. And uh, a good candidate, I think, are calcium waves, which are waves, regions of elevated intracellular calcium that can propagate through cells and throughout networks of cells. Um, these sort of waves have been observed in neurons. So a question to ask, what, could this substrate be the small field STMDs themselves? Um, also, glia, which are cells that are not electrically active, they're not neurons, but they reside in the nervous system. Calcium waves have been, have been described particularly in astrocytes, a form of glia. And this is something that I studied in a prior project here. So I think uh, I've raised a lot of research questions on the previous slide, and I want to make a pitch. I, might be no students in here that are still looking for project, but uh, there's an MS or probably even a PhD uh, that would come out of studying this and uh, have funding from a sponsor to support a student. So if anybody's interested or knows of anybody interested, I'm kind of pitching 
this uh, pitching this topic. Oh, let me go back here and see if I can click on. No, it's not going to show this movie. Anyway, I just had a movie of a wave here. But uh, at that point, um, to me personally, this is a fascinating subject. And uh, I've got about two and a half years of support for a student, or maybe two years. And um, there would be the opportunity to continue on a PhD with this, if anybody's interested. So if there's any questions, I'll take them now. We'll get done a little bit early. Thank you. Bombarded. <laughs> it's a, lot, a little bit different than usual talking this group. This is an application where somebody who has an interest.